welcome to School of Resistance, a discourse platform that invites experts on change around the world to discourse a blueprint for a politics of resistance. Tonight's conversation is called Blow the System, So Change, Destruction as a Tool for Survival, and we'll consider an ideology of destruction. What if self-destruction and destruction of property are the only tools left for survival in a hyper-capitalized world? What if destruction isn't an act of loss, but an act of love? This particular episode has been produced in the context of the Gentian Belmundo Festival, a locally city-based festival thinking about international solidarity. This year, the festival is devoted to the question how to change the system. My name is Elin Banken, and I'm very happy to contribute to this question together with these two interesting speakers who will join me in tonight's conversation. Our first guest speaker is the Associate Professor of Human Ecology at Lund University, Andreas Malm. In May, Verso will release White Skin, Black Fuel on the Danger of Fossil Fascism, a book he co-authored together with the Zetkin Collective. My second guest is the psychologist and author Marianne Donner. In her Zelfroostings book, Waarom we meer moeten stinken, drinken, bloeden, branden en dansen, translated, it's a manual to self-destruction, why we should smell, drink, lead, burn and dance more often. She accuses the self-help industry of keeping us in line by imposing yoga leggings, pedometers and positive thoughts. In the meantime, the book has also been published in Italy, Germany and Switzerland, and France will follow next this month. Before I open up the conversation, I want to remind the audience of the possibility to enter the discussion, and you can do so by posting your questions on the live stream on Facebook or by sending them to the email address schoolofresistance.entegent.be. So I would like to start this discussion by quoting a book of Andreas. It's called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Um, in that book, Andreas, you uh, give an overview of several historic revolutions, such as the abolitionist movement or the suffragettes, and illustrate the part of violence played in bringing about effective change. Connecting it to the climate crisis, you ask yourself, and I quote, when do we start physically attacking things that consume our planet and destroy them with our own hands? Is there a good reason why we have waited this long? What are your thoughts on the role of nonviolent protest plays in the current climate movement? Where do you think does it come from? And what do you think, and do you think that the current climate strategy could be redefined to encompass a notion of destruction? Yeah, uh, thanks, Elaine, for, uh, for having me on the School of Resistance, I should say, first. Um, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be part of this. Uh, so, I, um, uh, as you quoted from a book, I'm, I'm sort of posing the question of when, if ever, do we escalate in the climate movement and go beyond what we've done so far? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the climate movement in the global north, uh, more specifically. And so far, we have been very firmly committed to absolute nonviolent civil disobedience. And uh, this has been a productive, fruitful strategy that has uh, achieved a lot because the movement has uh, made an impact, has rallied a lot of people to the streets, notably in 2019 when we saw an unprecedented wave of climate mobilization, and can demonstrate a number of local victories, uh, often on a fairly small scale, but still uh, one a uh, terminal or pipeline project defeated here, uh, a coal-fired power plant there, and so on and so forth. So I am by no means uh, against this kind of nonviolent direct action to the contrary. I try to participate in it as often as I can, and uh, I describe just a few actions uh, that I've been part of in, in, uh, in Northern Europe recently in the book. And I'm not arguing that we should uh, um, desist from this kind of action uh, and and cancel that kind of, of tactic uh, but i do think that we need to diversify it and add more uh, confrontational and militant tactics uh, because i don't think and that's where the historical uh, cases come in i don't think there is any useful analogy to the climate struggle that hasn't involved a component of uh, property destruction uh, and other types of more radical confrontation with with the uh, ruling order, and, and we don't need to go very far back into history to to see this. I mean, just look at at the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. in 2020. After George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, the people there 
stormed the police station in the third precinct and burnt it down. And that was the act that catalyzed the wave of protests that then engulfed the country and turned into the largest social movement in US history, if you count the number of people participating in demonstrations. Uh, and um, uh, there is this idea that I refer to in the book as strategic pacifism, that as soon as you engage in anything like property destruction or what goes, what counts as, as violent tactic, you immediately lose mass support and alienate your base. But here, uh, in this case with BLM in the US, it was exactly the other way around that the uh, uh, targeting of police property immediately after the murder of George Floyd broke the paralysis around the structural and systematic violence perpetrated by the US police against African Americans and demonstrated very concretely that this is not a, an inexorable force. It's not beyond our influence. It's, it's something that we can go in and physically put an end to. Uh, by uh, uh, damaging or destroying the property from from which the, these racist cops operate, and it 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 drew in unprecedented uh, numbers of people into that movement. And I think that's uh, ju that's just one of many cases that the climate movement could learn from. Uh, and uh, I should say that that I'm far from the only one uh, posing this question. I I, I uh, I'm recommending to everyone right now the uh, marvelous novel The Ministry uh, for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, which deals quite a lot with a scenario of organized sabotage and destruction of uh, uh, the property that destroys the planet as, uh, as a central component of the transition as he imagines it might play out, even in the best case, if, because that's how he conceives in the book, that it's a sort of best case scenario for what might happen in the coming decades. And then a key element of that best case is uh, a concerted effort by people uh, particularly from the global south and more particularly from India, uh, to 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 put out of business fossil fuel infrastructure around the world. And let me just finish by saying that what what uh, what triggers that movement of sabotage in that novel is a hyper lethal heat wave that takes place in Uttar Pradesh in India in the year 2034. So that would be 13 years from now that kills 20 million people in one week because the temperatures reach a level that cannot be endured by human bodies. And it's after, it's after this event of an almost genocidal scale that young people in India start fighting back by destroying fossil fuel property around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just the other week, a paper was published in Nature Geoscience, one of the leading climate science journals, that demonstrated that this kind of heat wave is uh, on the way. It's coming, uh, particularly in tropical zones of the world that are pushed towards the limits of human uh, habitability and, and, and uh, adaptation because uh, temperatures of this kind are in the pipeline almost literally. Mm -hmm. And the question that, that he asks with this novel is, as I take it in the beginning of the novel, is, at what point do we start the fight back in these more concrete terms? And do we have to wait for a, a heat wave that kills 20 million people? Or should we start earlier? Uh, yeah, that's, that's how the question can be posed. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, because in the book, you're mainly talking about destruction, uh, destructing the fossil fuel property, so the infrastructure that produces, that transports fossil fuels, such as pipelines, mining areas, machines. Um, but at one point, you also turn to the destruction of private property, namely you refer to a group of Swedish activists that deflated the tires of SUVs in their cities in order to raise awareness to the pollutative effect they have. But I'm wondering, these sorts of actions, do they turn the action, do they turn responsibility, I'm sorry, no. Let me repeat it. These sorts of actions, I feel that they um, turn the attention to the responsibility of the consumer. Um, but how do you think do these two sort of actions, destruction of private property and destruction of the property producing fossil fuels, how do they relate to each other? Do you agree that pointing to consumption is diverting the attention from the role that the system plays in this yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Let me just say first that what these activists did in Sweden was not actually to destroy property and not even to damage it, but just very temporarily neutralizing those SUVs by 
deflating the tires. So you could just refill the, 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 the tires with mm -hmm. air and the SUV would be ready to go again. Uh, but I, I personally wouldn't be necessarily against more hands-on destruction of SUVs because SUVs are a, an incredibly important source in our current uh, predicament. Uh, I mean, believe it or not, but, but uh, figures from the International Energy Agency suggest that the rising share in SUV sales on the world car market has been the second largest driver of the increase in CO2 emissions uh, in the past decade. I mean, and, and these are machines that no one really need. It's not like there is a, a, a basic human need for SUVs that cannot be fulfilled by other cars that emit less. And uh, generally what we have here is a problem of elite consumption that, that uh, uh, is extremely destructive to the climate and thereby, uh, f I mean, in the end, contributing to the death of people Sorry, this is my son who's uh, knocking on the door here. Uh, <laughs> I'm on parental leave, so we have a little bit of a symbiosis going on right now. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, th this kind of consumption just goes on day after day, and uh, uh, there is no stigma attached to it. To the contrary, people often uh, regard it as the ideal, the model to strive for, to reach that kind of pinnacle of, of, uh, of high consumption. And it just can't continue that way. Another report that came out, and these reports are, you know, they they come out all the time. But there was one that that was published in uh, in last autumn from uh, Oxfam and Stockholm Environment Institute that showed that the richest one percent of humanity has, through its consumption, caused more than twice as large CO two emissions as the half, the poorest half of humanity since the 1990s so the one the richest one percent by driving suvs and being hyper frequent flyers and having the largest homes and living these kind of lifestyles uh, with super yachts and everything they have uh, contributed more than twice as much to the to global heating as the poorest half of humanity and when you think of it it's absolutely mind-boggling dizzying that, that the world can can be operating in this fashion. And I think that it's legitimate to try to uh, uh, to try to attach a question mark to that kind of consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, I, although I, I would still, I mean, I, I would much prefer that uh, climate movement that escalates and moves into uh, forms of sabotage, target fossil mm -hmm. fuel production, extraction, and the companies that produce and distribute things like SUVs or super yachts or private jets rather than uh, 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 personal consumers or they're, they're the goods that they have in their parking lots or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I don't see necessarily that, that it would have to be a distraction and a diversion to target the luxury emissions of the ultra-rich. I think uh, the rich, the, the ultra-rich do not have any kind of sacred right to combust this planet to death uh, uh, although they they now go about their lives as if they had that kind of right mm -hmm. but i think the time has come to puncture and deflate yeah. that right in hands on manner yes that's also something that, that we find in your book marianne like the individualization of the climate cli crisis um, by focusing on, on consumption behavior that we divert the attention from what indeed the super rich or the system uh, and, and the system that is making these choices for us. Um, another tendency I feel that is closely related to this is the issue of shaming. Um, people are often shamed for eating meat, for they, are, they feel guilty for taking the plane, etc. Um, I am wondering also because you're a psychologist, how productive do you think shame is in, in the climate movement? What effect do you think do these sorts of feelings have um, when it comes to, um, yeah, fighting the climate crisis. Yeah, well, um, yeah, there has been a, done a lot of research about this, and shame is is a really, really corrosive emotion. Um, it makes it makes you feel really small. It involves self hatred, and for millennia in history it's been a form of punishment also shaming the public shaming of people um but it 
it works um but again it it diverts the the attention and I, and i really see it as a, a tactic in the 60s you you had uh, you had this slogan the the personal is political uh which me means your how your life is lived that's a political question and nowadays under neoliberal ideology it, it has been changed so now the 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 political has been made personal so we constantly make things personal if people get a burnout it's not because of of a constant stress of being under a flex contract or not being able to pay your insanely high rent but it, you need to yoga more and you need to learn to say no it's your problem if you are unhappy or depressed or anxious it's not because the world is really depressive or that um our communities have been broken but it's something wrong in your brain you need to take a pill if your son or daughter can cannot sit still in class it's not because the classes are way too full um the the teachers are way too busy there's not a time enough time to play no it's because of their brain they need to uh, take ritalin so in this way everything is constantly made personal um, and and that in in a way it's like saying well this system we live in that is good it's working and if it's not working for you then it is your fault and you need to change yourself and you see the same in the in the climate debate or debate in the, in the climate in the struggle for climate justice uh, uh, it's changing a little bit now, but but it used to be for a very long time. You need to 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 uh, use less plastic, and uh, you need to eat better and less meat, and and it's sort of a lie because it's not going to change a lot. If everybody does it, it will, but it it won't because uh, we have a problem in the production of of things it's more of a yeah it, it, it's it's you have always have a supply and uh, demand market and we think that that demand is is uh, um is what what the supply is based on but it's again the other way around there's a lot of supply uh, and so demand is created and and that it needs to change so, and while I agree with Andreas that the 1% have a lifestyle that is outrageous, <laughs> um, still I think um, that it is not useful. Shaming is not a useful tactic uh, because it makes things personal um, um, and individualized and kind of feel sorry for, for people when they are ashamed because it yeah. it really is a really bad emotion of guilt it, it, it the church uh for the, it's it rested on it by by playing the guilt and the shame card it's a religious thing almost and um i would rather see it uh, go yeah in a way it also reminds me a bit like you say or you refer to this Ritalin or like this yoga. So in a way, you could also see it as a form of self-deception de because I also think that people make themselves believe that they need it in order to um, to function in this world, so to say. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and in a sort of way, it it's it. People want people want to know um, what they can do, and it, and it's sort of a way. It seems like it's easier to change yourself than to change the whole world mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah but in the end it, it's it's a form of self-discipline you you just you just um last year there was a there there was a a, a a sort of strike by workers from starbucks in the united states and uh the workers demanded more uh, better working hours and a better salary and more stability uh, and they, they didn't even go on strike, but they filled in a petition. And so the 
the the heads. Um, they took in this petition and after a few weeks they came back to the workers and they said, yeah, we listened to you very well and this is what we are going to do. You all get a, a subscription to Headspace from now on. And Headspace is a mindfulness mm -hmm. uh, app. So this is literally <laughs> how it works. Mm -hmm. People are like... Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, they, they, they are, um, how do you say this? Um, they adapt to the system by mindfulness yoga so they can take more, more of the stress that the world and society is putting on them. And they don't look, well, the workers did, but in general, the, they, they look less at what's wrong with the system yeah. and try to fit in with all these mm -hmm. tools. Yeah, yeah. In a way, this also beautifully connects to the the subtitle of the book, like why we should smell, drink, bleed, burn, and dance more often. That it's a clear call to indeed step out of this neo liberal logic of self optimization of a constant adaptation to to a system that might not be healthy. Um, could you elaborate on this thought and express your viewpoints on how self destruction could have like an emancipatory tool or an emancipatory result? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I meant the, so. The, so the word self destruction, of course, is a, is an antidote to, to the self help industry, uh, which is constantly uh, saying optimize yourself, be better, adapt better to uh, the world as it is. And in my book, I keep saying, uh, well, you you are not the problem here. The problem is the world we live in. Um, but it, it's also kind of the, the self-destruction of your neoliberal self, your neoliberal um, super ego, <laughs> Freud would say. Um, so, so this self that wants to uh, adapt, and I, it's like it's like. I see it as like like people are are more and more by this optimization, which strangely enough is always the same for everyone. So we we it it, it is said we live in a hyper individualized uh, times, but somehow the best version for everyone is the same. So it's it's fit and tight and very productive. And if you're a woman, you have pumped up lips and you are eternally young and um, so if you look on Instagram or, or social media everybody starts looking more and more the same and it's some it's like robots who come out of uh, how do you call that forgot the word but um, yeah it, it, it's it, it's reducing us to hard-working robots to be as productive as possible, not waste any time, but always work, 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 and um, go in this grind thing culture. Mm -hmm. And my my things, the sub subtitle uh, and the, the titles of the, the chapters, um, is 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 making you human again. It's uh, to be human is to stink. Uh, and sweat, uh, and and it is uh, to drink that is waste time, and that's how I wrote it. Some is take is taken literally, others not, but it's 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 yeah, it's to waste time and not be productive mm -hmm. and be in a different kind of uh, in a yeah. static mood. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's all about, yeah, a, a very, I think, a very dehumanizing culture um, and the resistance against that and, and the destruction of the, the robots mm -hmm. that, that come out of this culture and to be human again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I remember that in, um, in a column you wrote in Google that uh, you referred to the NAP Ministry, which is an initiative by Tricia Hersey, uh, and it's an attempt to dismantle capitalism and white supremacy by napping and by daydreaming, and by really stepping out of the system, so to say. Um, how do you think that, considering this form of inactivism, if I could say that, is this 
is this compatible with a form of progress do you think because of course like progress is of course associated with with this idea of neoliberal self optimization or optimization and and um bettering yourself bettering the world but if you so if you if we take like initiatives such as Trisha Hersey's and App Ministry, which clearly advocates a form of inactivism, if I can say that, would that mean that that is incompatible with progress? Or how do you feel towards that? Well, yeah, in, in that case, every everything depends on what you call progress, how you define progress. And nowadays, progress is defined as growth. Um, uh, so so ec economically, growth or personal growth and of course money wise so we uh, uh we need to consume more earn more be more everything has to be more but obviously <laughs> this is not progress uh, because it's destroying um people and animals and the earth itself so that is not a sustainable uh, way of living that is a dis very destructive way of living. So, uh, yeah, this system with with the ideology that belongs with it that needs to be destroyed. And I think that's why I wrote my book. I think it's really hard to destroy a system when you do not attack the ideology that goes with it, because this ideology. Uh, of growth and and self optimization and robotization is everywhere. It's in commercials, it's in movies, it's in social media, it's in books. It's it's uh, so you also need to attack that um, to yeah hopefully <laughs> dismantle a, a system because that I wanted to say that uh, and that that connects Andreas also with me. Because what this does, if everything is made personal, um, um, it, it, it turns the energy inwards. People start looking at themselves, what is wrong with me? How can I be better? But that energy needs to go outwards. Um, and Andreas has a whole plan for that. What you do once the energy goes outwards. But but what I would like to do is first change that within a person so mm -hmm. do not look at yourself what is wrong with you go outwards and all this mm -hmm. energy and self-hatred and guilt and shame uh, needs to go there mm -hmm. and then yeah. you can act mm -hmm. yeah i'm wondering andreas uh, because of course in how to blow up a pipeline you uh, call for quite another for form of activism you you question how the revolution could be optimized possibly by considering a form of activism that goes beyond or that goes together um, with peaceful protests, but next to that also has a form of a more militant approach. What do you think of this form of this sorts of inactivism? Do you think um, it works or? Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that the, I mean, if we look at it very concretely, the uh, combustion of fossil fuels is ongoing and growing, and the accumulation of capital by means of uh, extracting and selling fossil fuels is uh, as rampant as ever. And um, there was just a report that some of you might have seen saying that since 2015, when the Paris Agreement was negotiated, the 60 largest banks in the world have pumped something like four trillion dollars into projects for extracting more fossil fuels. So uh, uh, the capitalist class, to speak frankly, is still uh, enriching itself more and more by taking out even more fuels to pour on the planetary fire. And how do we deal with this? Do we deal with it by being inactive or do we deal by it with it by, by targeting it more uh, effectively than we've done so far and more uh, straightforward and uh, uh, aggressively, if you like. And I think, uh, obviously I'm leaning towards the latter. Uh, 
I, I agree that shame is not the productive emotion here. The, the one mo emotion that, that needs to be fanned is anger. And uh, research suggests that if there is one uh, emotion that drives social movement mobilization, it is anger, it is rage, and there is a lot to be angry about and upset about in, in the sphere of uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that something like uh, so, like Total, the, the the single largest private company in France, is about to go into the Arctic to drill for even more fossil gas to take out and and sell on the market, or the 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 fact that solar geoengineering is coming closer and closer as uh, as an alternative option for addressing this this problem, which will just uh, throw us down the lane of another kind of, of, of disaster in the climate system, most likely. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I, I, for me, it's not about uh, so much optimizing the... I mean, that's not, that's not a term that I would use, but yes, we do need to look for uh, strategies and tactics that work. I mean, we, we have no other uh, uh, option, really, than to... Uh, 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 look for forms of mobilization that work. And this is not about uh, cultivating a lifestyle, an activist lifestyle, mm -hmm. but about uh, using different means to draw in as many people as possible into the climate movement and the mobilization that it uh, is engaged in with its allies. Uh, and uh, to refer again to the wonderful novel that I mentioned, the, the Ministry for the Future, if there will be a transition ever away from fossil fuels, it would be a very turbulent process. It would be messy. It would be filled with contradictions. It will in involve a lot of people in many different roles, uh, you know, including everything from, from sabotage to negative emissions to uh, regenerative agricultural cooperatives and, and the whole spectrum of activity. Uh, and this is not about, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, furnishing a particular identity of activism, uh, uh, not about shaming people. And I agree that that shame is not the best motion to emotion to to this uh, and and people into mobilization. On the other hand, I, I'd I'd like to point out that a lot of social progress is about. that certain activities are unacceptable. So, other people, in slavery, for instance, it was absolutely illegal once slavery was finally abolished. And the same with, with child labor uh, and, and other forms of exploitation. And uh, uh, I think the task here is to lay down in, in as concrete terms as possible, that it is not acceptable to uh, burn profligate amounts of fossil fuels. That is a form of crime, and it needs to be dealt with as such. And, and because our states are still not capable of, of laying down that principle, that we need to step forth and do it uh, from outside of the states, uh, obviously with the aim of eventually pushing the states to um, to enact the, the necessary legislation and uh, set set full transition in, in motion. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. these are some of my thoughts. Yeah, you Can briefly... you say something? Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, because I think it, they are totally complementary. So it the inaction is within the machine, so to say. The inaction is to uh, to to not um, be a radar in this machine. Uh, if if you if you rest, which maybe is a healthier, like the net ministry says, is which is healthier than my uh, drinking. But if if you rest, uh, she 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 says that because um, you you take yourself out of this mindset and this grind culture that keeps us. Uh, keeps us within. The inactive is not <laughs> on things where you need to be active. I, I, I totally agree. But as Andrea says, uh, you have to get mad and you have to get angry. Uh, but as I said, this energy goes inwards nowadays. People get mad and angry at themselves because they feel like a loser or because they 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 stand outside of the system. And what I to get mad, that energy has to go outwards. 
um, not to yourself, uh, but outwards, and then you can act. I totally agree with it, with that. So these two things are complementary. They they mm-hmm. are just different things, but I th- think they align. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. what I want. <laughs> and I'm just wondering as well, because I also get why the feeling of anger would be a much more fruitful breeding ground than the feeling of shame. But of course, and... Anger is also like very likely or is, is, can um, have this effect indeed of destruction and violence and, and, and looting. And how aren't you afraid? It's, it's more a question to Andreas perhaps that um, as soon as a climate movement might consider a more militant approach, an approach of destruction, that it gets easily like stigmatized as being a terrorist grouping because the, the logics or the logic of, of of violence has been often uh, associated with not that valid revolutions that happen, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, of course, there's that risk. I mean, every every kind of climate activism, mobilization runs the risk of uh, demonization. I mean, even Extinction Rebellion, it, it, although it, it observed absolutely perfect uh, nonviolent civil disobedience, at least until very late in the day in 2019 with the infamous tube action was accused of being terrorists or you know Nigel Farage of the UKP used the term economic terrorism for for the XR London actions uh, and if you step up and actually destroy things of course some people will call you terrorists and the far right will hate you and, and maybe even more than they've done so far uh, this this uh, this is inherent to the problem, just as the BLM uh, wave in, in 2020 in the U.S. elicited enormous uh, rage uh, and hate from the white supremacists who uh, were absolutely convinced that BLM was guilty of terrorism. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean that that it was in any way wrong or unwise to do what BLM did. And uh, when you are facing uh, an enemy that is extremely powerful in society, there is no way around polarization and antagonism. You cannot win over that enemy by being kind and nice and gentle. This is what we've tried in the climate movement for some time. And I really fundamentally believe that fossil capital, most east and mo- mo- most primarily the, the corporations that profit from production of fossil fuels. I mean, that that's a force that needs to be vanquished and that needs to be put out of business. We cannot have a, a habitable climate and these kind of corporations at the same time. We have to choose. That means that if we're going to win this fight, of course, we're going to suffer backlash and uh, various forms of uh, uh, <clears throat> of uh, yeah demonization the important thing for for the climate movement is to not actually go down the route of terrorism which means do not kill people do not more particularly kill innocent civilians to create fear because that is what terrorism is all about as long as you are intelligent and precise in targeting the material sources of destruction, you have at least a fair chance of convincing people that what you're doing is not terrorism, because it isn't. What you're doing is you are taking out the machines that are destroying the planet and actually, uh, at the end of the day, taking the lives of multitudes, which is an activity that comes at least closer to the definition of terrorism than what it would be to take those machines offline. Uh, but I, I really can't stress enough. First of all, we shouldn't do uh, at this stage uh, any harm to people from the climate movement. That would be disastrous and it would be wrong. And uh, we need to be cautious and careful and smart about any kind of escalation and di- diversification of tactics. And that means if you do something that comes close to destroying pro- property or anything like that, you need to be able to explain to people why you're doing it. And you need to be able to gain some level of mass support for it. And it needs to be part of a mass movement, just like the property destruction that ran through the BLM mobilization of last year was part of the mass movement in the U.S. Mm-hmm. I mean, all, all through from Minneapolis to, to Portland and Kenosha and all those places, you had a radical flank in the BLM movement that targeted properties of cops. What you did not have, thankfully, 
were BLM activists who uh, assassinated police chiefs or sent suicide bombers into police mm-hmm. headquarters or something like that. That would have been terrorism. That would have been uh, that would have done damage to the movement. But the the radical flank that you had as the cutting edge of the mobilization, uh, actually, I do think contributed to pushing the BLM struggle to another level last year. And that's what we need to see in the climate struggle when the next wave of mobilization comes. I think, again, (laughs) I want to say something. I think uh, uh, what you see is is in these days that property, of course, is something holy. There is no nothing holier than property and a man is his property. So, So audiences are really um not very open i think to destroying property um and that's why because i agree with uh, andreas uh but that's what should along with it is a discussion about ownership and about uh whose property is this so you we we have to discuss the uh, who um owns the amazon for for instance um, and now it, it's not the people who live there. It's not uh, the Brazilians. It's not uh, the animals who live there, but it's uh, Unilever or uh, the, the big companies who, who make soy plantages uh, there. So so along, um, yeah, we need to discuss the, who, who owns the planet, and but also personally who owns uh, our, our time, our attention, um, our work, um so the way we we structure uh, structured um businesses is is with ownership of a few um how do you call them um and they holders shareholders <laughs> shareholders <laughs> who who take in the profit and if you work for 40 years somewhere you own nothing um and you see that that is coming up with businesses who try to think differently uh, about this and 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 think about ownership and i think this should be like a discussion that we should have on all grounds um uh about the planet and 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 also about our lives and as i said who who owns our our time is is my time because i have a smartphone is it it is it in my boss time? He can call me <laughs> any time he w- he likes. Uh, uh, who owns my attention? We have this social media, which we are made to be addictive uh, to. So along with the de- <laughs> Andreas uh, destruction, this is a topic we, we, we should uh, talk about. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. It might questioning yourself about like these questions, who owns our time who owns our attention we could maybe reconsider more about what it is we are actually devoting our time to to really you make make the best use of it so to say and and in this way i'm again <laughs> using this terminology of the best use and then i'm falling maybe into the trap of this optimization again um but it's it's an interesting question i do want to say because we received some questions from the audience i'm happy to read them to you um the first one is to andreas i think so it's a have when as marianne says we should resist the hyper individualized world we live in what are your thoughts on this well uh we live in a hyper individualized world and much uh much of what goes for activism these days is fairly atomized and uh, largely due to to social media it's quite evanescent and and transient and it's about individuals coming together on a very temporary basis uh, often responding to calls for demonstrations or something like that coming together and then disappearing and everyone uh, goes home and uh, and that's the end of that wave of demonstration and and then the news cycle moves on um, I think we need to find ways of building more solid uh, forms of organization uh, that lasts longer than uh, what a more or less spontaneous wave of, of demonstrations is prone to do. 
Uh, and I think that you know any, any kind of uh, action of of the, of the sort I've been uh, considering here and and to some extent advocating uh, is a question of acting collectively. I mean, uh, together, uh, groups of people. Uh, not, it, can, it can be. Uh, enormously large groups of people or it can also be smaller groups of people but it has to be collective action and it has to be part of some kind of mass mobilization so, and and do we have the agency to do that well we we don't we're not exercising that agency at least not very successfully and certainly now under the pandemic the climate movement has cancelled all activities and just retreated very obediently uh, to everyone's individual home and screen which is disastrous in a sense uh, the, the, once again, BLM and and the other instances. I mean, the movement in Belarus or the the uh, abortion rights movement in Poland and other cases have shown now in Myanmar that it's actually possible to have a, a social mobilization, even revolt mm -hmm. under conditions of a pandemic. Uh, so the climate movement needs to to uh, get off its ass again and get back on the streets. Uh, <clears throat> I, I do think that there are. Uh, it's it's not technically or physically or even psychologically impossible for us to act as collectives and do it in a more sustained and effective fashion than, than what we've seen in recent years. Uh, we just need to learn and, and perhaps relearn mm -hmm. how to do that. Maybe you want to respond as well, Marianne, on this idea of learning how these collective sorts of action again? And yeah, 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 I'm the, yeah, no, yeah, I, I agree uh, with Andreas, it's, the word learning is, is, is a good one, we need to learn collective action again, because of course, again, this individual, individualization huh, um, is also a tactic, uh, the, the, as I said before, uh, communities have been broken, um, once there were libraries, there's still libraries, but a lot less and uh, more, um, I don't know the, yeah, all the English words for this, but uh, community centers and, mm -hmm. and where elderly pe people met younger and et cetera. And they have all disappeared because people uh, should be, um, uh, take care of themselves and, and it was all too expensive. So communities have been broken and we have, I don't know if we're that individualized, but we have been atomized, made atoms. So it's difficult to find each other again in a in a collective goal. Again, also because of this ideology that 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 you need to take care of yourself and uh, uh, um, altruism altruism doesn't exist. Uh, we're all in competition with each other, but I think um we're learning again you see that uh, the, as, as with black lives matter and with the climate movement um because yeah the, people people find each other again so i'm really hopeful in in that yeah. way that that we're mm -hmm. yeah, on, a, on a good trend yeah before I turn to mind questions again, there is one more that I received. It's a question to the both of you, I assume. Um, and it says, what are your thoughts on expropriation and socialization? How can we reinvent these ideas without repeating the horrors of the 20th century? If uh, anybody of you wants to take the lead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm very happy to talk about this, but Marianne, do you want to go first? No, you go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm all for reviving uh, notions of so socialization and expropriation. I think a key demand for people in countries where private fossil fuel corporations exist or where they are headquartered is to demand their immediate nationalization. So in the Netherlands, uh, an obvious demand should be that Shell be nationalized and uh, instantly instructed to terminate all fossil fuel production and the, the entity should be transformed into something else. Uh, for instance, an organization for uh, taking CO2 out of the air instead of adding to it. And the same for uh, BP, Total, ExxonMobil and all the others. And of course, there is a whole... Uh, massive section of uh, these kind of companies that are already state-owned 
And there the task is to compel the state to do what's necessary with these companies, namely to, to order them to stop doing what they're doing and turning them into something different. But in, in, in countries where the property is private, the struggle begins by making it national and taking over those companies. And we really need to, need to understand that human survival is not compatible with private property and fossil fuels. We can not have, I mean, we can't end this century with continued private property in fossil fuels, as in the right for, for private property owners to take up coal or oil or gas and sell them on the market, or for private owners to take those fuels and burn them. It's just a question of time. If we want to have a biosphere in which we can live, that these resources will have to be put under public control and uh, the ownership of them, uh, the private ownership of them terminated. Uh, the task for the climate movement is to make that happen sooner rather than later. How to avoid the, the, the mistakes of the 20th century? Well, that's a question of uh, understanding the causes of the, the mistakes um, and the horrors that uh, ensued in uh, uh, in the in the Soviet bloc, so that that's a question of what is what our understanding of the the reasons for why we had something like Stalinism. And I, for one, don't think that the reason that we got Stalinism in in the Soviet Union and its satellite states was that there was something inherently oppressive with socializing the means of production. I think we had completely different reasons, notably the isolation of the Russian Revolution in a in a very uh, impoverished uh, uh, part of the world and its failure to spread into Germany and other uh, other parts of the country that that condemned the Russian Revolution to degeneration but that's that's a, a, a historical discussion that we should mm -hmm. take another time mm -hmm. but i think that uh, a transition away from fossil fuels in this century will have to be global just as uh, socialism in one country was an impossibility in the 20th century, it, it, it degenerated and becomes, became Stalinism and then eventually it became capitalism again. Mm -hmm. This century, uh, a transition away from fossil fuels in one country doesn't make sense at all. It has to be global. And that means that the dynamic will be very different from what we saw in, uh, uh, in Russia and what came out from that country. Thank you. Yeah. I keep thinking about a, a whole other subject, but I'm reading a book about quantum mechanica, um, Helgoland, it's called. And somehow uh, it is discussed in this book about quantum mechanica. Uh, the, the Russian Revolution is also discussed and what went wrong there um, from a quantum mechanic perspective. But I'm, I'm thinking about this because um, yeah, he says sort of the mistake Lenin made um, uh, was um, that they had this ideal that they knew exactly what kind of world they wanted to build. Um, and I think for me, uh, everything starts with a no. So, so this this is not good. No, and then after, after you after you say no, people always say yes. But what is your yes? What, what kind of world do you envision? You have to have a vision of this new world. But I don't think so. And I think in the book you mentioned, Andreas, the Ministry of, uh, mm, I read an interview with the writer, and he also says this it that it's like little steps that we figure out with each other what kind of build you want what kind of world you want to build afterwards or going to that point instead of having this one vision and everything has to move it, it's it's really about um yeah baby steps um, coming together. And I, of course, I don't know exactly, nobody knows how this should be done, uh, but it's a yes that we can figure out uh, after we have said no. So that is my really vague answer to this. <laughs> That's of course, no problem. Um, <laughs> I do want to address it's it's one more tendency that I that I experience when I'm watching uh, the climate movement. Um, it seems for me, and you could always correct me if you think that I'm wrong, 
um, that the activism has some sort of being appropriated by, by the capitalist system. Um, because I feel, especially also because of the advertising, we already touched upon it, like social media, there has become like a very specific and concrete image of what an activist lifestyle, what it should look like. Um, and it's a similar logic I feel that we now see with the current pandemic and how uh, with the care crisis and how big industries are now capitalizing on the care by by care washing and and by um so i'm wondering what your thoughts or are, are on this idea of activism being uh, appropriated by capitalism and i am wondering also because the uh, overall team of the festival this uh, discussion is part of has been devoted to system change i am wondering how can we take down a system um, that takes benefit of all the actions that we carry out in order to take it down it's a question to the both of you so anybody who feels okay. Okay. if you want to respond my oh <laughs> yeah yeah um um yeah no it's but this this might be the biggest power of capitalism the way it always takes in uh, um, resistance to it so um, I believe it is in a book I forgot his name in capitalist realism Mark Fisher Mark Fisher he quotes uh, Kurt Cobain who once said uh, nothing plays better on MTV than a protest against MTV. So somehow the system is always capable of taking it in and then Shell makes, uh, starts telling you how you could uh, lower your footprint and everything. So that is uh, um, a danger. Uh, it takes the radicalism uh, out of it. Um, um and yeah how how th there's nothing you can do to stop that um but uh, it it's sort of um um you have to be more radical then to 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 still attack the system um so so uh yeah that that's what <laughs> that's what we're doing right now uh being more radical um um, and I think one of the, I, I, sorry, I don't know if you said this or if you emailed this uh, earlier, but, but one of the, the, the problems is also that it, it's, it's, it's not really a lot of uh, fun to be, <laughs> to be an activist. It's, it's really, uh, of course, because the world is really depressing and, and uh, um, it, it and it, I think, uh, because we we've been learned so much to 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 um, uh, punish ourselves and self hatred that we're not doing enough. That 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 we're not. I can't find the words anymore. Uh, that it, that has taken the energy also out of us and out of the struggle and 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 the fun. And but again, my opinion is as soon as we stop doing all this energy inwards and blaming ourselves and pushing it outwards and nothing is impossible anymore and the fun can go back and and the, the energy also yeah i mean this is something that the left and anti-capitalist social movements have had to struggle with for a long time the, the ability of capitalism to co-opt Pro forms of protests and not the least their aesthetics but when it comes to the climate movement uh, there are certain forms of uh, action that so far haven't uh, been amenable for co-optation uh, and that's that's the more radical kind of mass action that we've seen. i mean fridays for future is one thing and you can have a uh, uh, politicians and even businessmen posing with greta thunberg uh, or something like that but i haven't yet seen that kind of co-optation of something like the climate camps, which is the, the form of, a, of, of climate movement that I 
praised the most lavishly in my uh, book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, and that I have identified with most uh, closely in, in recent years, uh, particularly M. de Gelende, the climate camp movement in Germany, but it has its its Dutch offshoot in uh, Corder Road and, and uh, other similar climate camps across Europe. Uh, of course, inspired by Standing Rock and, and other mm -hmm. indigenous uh, protest camps in North America. And in those camps, people certainly have a lot of fun. There's a lot of dancing happening in those camps, and people certainly stink. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think they bleed too, and uh, uh, yeah, smoke and uh, have a lot of fun. Uh, so you can certainly, I mean, in that kind of collective communal space, uh, you can uh, release a lot of these uh, these emotions mm. because it's it's a lot about uh, you know finding community and uh, and uh, collective solidarity in living differently while at the same time targeting the uh, the property that is at the root of the problem uh, and this this is one of the most promising forms of action that that I know for the climate movement now unfortunately it's all on hold on pause because of the pandemic i hope it can kick off uh, again very soon yes yeah but that is the point because because a collective action it's so much much more difficult to appropriate that or to uh, co-opt that um, and to to uh, to individualize it and sell it on a t-shirt uh, that th that is really difficult so that is the way uh, to go indeed to um, come together yes so yeah yeah thank you and also actually thank you for um, initiating my last question to the both of you uh, which was exactly on this notion of joy and uh because it seems sometimes that there's like a tendency towards a rigid sort of ascetic lifestyle where there is little room left for pleasure and joy when it comes to fighting a crisis so my final question to the both of you even though you already touched upon it would be how much joy is there allowed or you think is necessary in in fighting for a better world yeah, necessary, everything, uh, that, that uh, one of the uh, interesting things nowadays is if you look at the elite, uh, the, so the 1%, the 1% always uh, used to be a lot of eating, a lot of partying, uh, letting it all hang out. But if you now look at, at the, the, the CEOs at Silicon Valley, especially the one from Twitter, who I forgot his name, they are so uh, self-controlled. They 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 fast. They um, they 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 take cold ice baths. They they live a really joyless, <laughs> stoic existence. Uh, and say to people, "Do just like me, and then you will be successful too." And people say, "Okay, I will live a joyless uh, uh, existence too." Um, so, uh, uh, but that was on a side note. But no, I think, uh, uh, yeah, to to the the it all starts with with uh, uh, with the joy and and also with um, feeling. How do you say that? Um, uh, yeah, feeling good enough for that joy. So, not. Oh. Oh. I think now you're back. There was a slide. You are not productive or not so much. Oh. Was I lost? I think not. Yes, you were lost. We lost you a bit. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> focusing that in yeah energy outwards yeah all right thank you andreas 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't really. I mean, my my own experience of collective action is not that it's well, at least not since the 1990s. Thing, um, ascetical asceticism and renunciation and and uh, and things like that. I mean, s certain things will have to be renounced. No, or for such fuels and that that it is perceived that way by climb people who don't see the necessary necessity to to fight climate change they feel that the left people on the left are really joyless and and uh, and <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it, it, even something like a riot or a big or a square occupation or uh, some other kind of of carnival of uh, revolt tends to involve quite a lot of fun. I I have to say. Uh, so I'm all for combining rage with joy. Uh, mm -hmm. That that's what revolutionary politics uh, has been about for a long time, and that's what it. Yes, all right. I think it's indeed might be indeed a good idea to invite some of the more skeptics to one of the climate camps or yeah, one of the yeah, riots. Yeah. I think that could be a very fruitful start. All right, the both of you, thank you very much for joining me tonight in this conversation in which we discussed how a discourse of destruction might enable taking down the system and we considered several possible strategies in building up a world anew. Uh, once more, thank you for um, for this, and I'm very happy to continue and redefine protests and resistance in the new future with you. Um, before I say goodbye to the audience, I have the pleasure of, uh, of announcing something, namely the worldwide release of the new gospel. It's the newest movie by me. Um, after its premiere in Venice, um, the movie is now widely released and can be watched from April the 1st till April 4th via the website of um, Tickets cost 8 euros and subtitles are available in Dutch, French, Italian and English. Um, since we believe this is, movie is an exemplary illustration of how, how art and activism managed to take down the system, I very much want to encourage you all to watch it. So I'm wishing you all a good night for now. Uh, thank you once more and hope to see you Thank soon. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. It was a pleasure. Bye. A joy. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>